Yes! Warning, the following video will contain several jump scares from the various Five Nights at Freddy's games. If you've seen our other videos on Five Nights at Freddy's, you know what to expect. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Completionist. And today, we have an awesome special guest here. He's one of my best friends in the YouTube space as well as in real life. I love this guy so much, he makes literally some of the best content on the planet. Everyone, please welcome back to the show, Matthew Patrick from Game Theory. Oh, you're talking about me! I, I, who else do you think I'm talking about? <laughs> I thought someone was gonna walk through the door and like, Hey, it's me, I'm the special guest! Psych! <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Gerard. I'm, I'm glad to be here, buddy. Absolutely, man. Of course. So, Matt, before we start today's episode, I do have to announce something kind of special today. Sure. Uh, we actually have two brand new t-shirts available right now at theyeti.com. The one we've got right now is one I'm wearing. It's called the Struggle is Real t-shirt, and it features not only the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise, but it showcases all the games we've completed on the show, as well as a few in the future, which you may or may not get when you look at the image of the shirt. We also have a brand new shirt called the Bearded Mantra. Uh, it was my special birthday shirt that was made back in January, and we're releasing it now uh, in the public. And if you buy both shirts, you'll actually save some money and you get some of these Mother 3 frog in a car stickers. These are awesome. You can stick them everywhere and make them rain. I made, I made it rain for a good solid second there. <laughs> All those things available right now over at theyeti.com slash that one video gamer. That was a, a really lengthy monologue there, Gerard. Thanks for letting me stand here and enjoy that the whole time. At least it didn't make you wear a t-shirt. You were saying? Sorry, I'm not sorry. There is no doubt that the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise has spawned a lot of great theories, fan art drawings, and more importantly, it created a community hell-bent on figuring out what exactly is going on over the course of these games. And so here we are. Scott Cawthon has managed to scare us one more time. Let's see what really takes place during Five Nights at Freddy's 3. <laughs> Within the Five Nights universe, we've established that the story is all but straightforward. We've been given breadcrumbs after breadcrumbs to slowly piece everything together. And while the lore remains pretty cryptic up to this point, we're about to dive into an even deeper rabbit hole. The gameplay has fluctuated and the visuals have improved a fair amount between the games. The first game featured pretty basic controls, the second game spiced it up a fair amount, with the removal of doors, the addition of a flashlight, and a mask. Scott has done a very good job at keeping us on our toes. So here we are, another five nights, another location, another trip with some of our favorite animatronics. It's animatronic mixed with the word monster, get it? Also, if you haven't seen our other videos on this game series, check them out or else this video isn't going to flow that well with you. And while you're at it, check out my theory videos on the lore of Five Nights at Freddy's. Didn't you reference my videos in your last two? Yeah, how's that for free promotion? Eh, all right, all right. I forgive you for the shirt thing. While Five Nights 2 ended up being a prequel to the original, Five Nights 3 decided to head to the opposite extreme and enter the series as a sequel set 30 years after the events of the first game. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and the horrible unsolved murders that took place have now been passed into an urban legend, and an unknown group is looking to cash in that story by opening Fazbear's Fright, the horror attraction. Your character enters the equation as, you guessed it, the security guard at this soon-to-be-open location. The presumed owner calls you on the first night and fills you in on how everything is going with preparations for launch, including news on recent findings of relics from the Freddy Fazbear locations. He talks about a lead he has from someone claiming to have designed one of the Freddy Fazbear buildings and that he's on the way to check it out right now to try and find more stuff for the attraction. After that, you're brought up to speed on your duties as security guard, checking cameras and vents, you know, the usual stuff. You're also told to use your maintenance panel to keep your cameras, audio, and ventilation systems up and running, because there's a serious issue with all the old tech they used to make the building, and if you don't keep those vents going, you'll start hallucinating. Oh, and also, the place might burn down. So, uh, yeah, there's that. 
It's not until night two, though, that things get really interesting. On the previous night, the so-called phone dude apparently had some successful findings, and he tells you he found some very old training tapes for new employees, and, more importantly, a real one. Oh, uh, gotta go, man. Uh... Well, well, look, it's in there somewhere. I'm, I'm sure you'll see it. He cuts the call short and plays you one of the tapes, but now you know that things just got real. You are sharing the building with a real-life Freddy Fazbear animatronic. Every night from then on, you hear another part of the training tape, which tells you about the new hybrid animatronic suit that can be adjusted to allow humans inside of them by cranking open the springs on the back. You also learn that these new suits aren't exactly the safest, and the tape goes as far as saying, don't breathe on the spring locks, because moisture from your breath can cause the locks to come loose and... well... ugh. At the end of the night, you get to play another Atari-style minigame just like the Random Death minigames from Five Nights 2. These ones are definitely a lot easier to understand this time around, but they hold a ton of deep and convoluted secrets that we'll touch on later on. Wait, so, uh, there's only one animatronic, and it's not even called Freddy? In the first game, we had five animatronics. The second one had at least, what, 10, 12? But Five Nights 3, we get one? Okay, okay, budget cuts. That doesn't seem to- <laughs> Jesus! All right, all right, family-friendly show, no swearing. <laughs> Five Nights 3 is on another level with the visuals and audio. The cameras are all decrepit and insanely staticky. All of the hallways of Fazbear's Fright are filled with stuff that looks like it's trying to kill you. Pieces of old animatronics like heads and bodies are propped up to look all spooky and end up making checking the cameras stressful because everything looks like it's the thing you should be looking for. The audio plays a big role in these games and there are a lot of pros and just a few cons to the third game's new audio tracks. The voice work is still done solely by the game's creator, Scott Cawthon, portraying both the phone dude and also the guy from the Fazbear training tapes. The creepy ambient sounds in the second game to warn you about the approaching animatronics do make a comeback, though this time they're a little more toned back. And honestly, it works pretty well for a more subtle experience. Now, if there's one thing these games are known for, it's the jump scares. And I gotta say, it's all over the place in the third installment. Your main enemy is the animatronic Springtrap, and after the first few times dying to him, the scare factor wears off pretty quickly. On the bright side, though, the audio cue is far more reserved than the past couple of games, making this one much easier on the ears, while still being loud enough to cause a jump. On the other hand, Springtrap just kind of slinks forward towards you. I mean, look at this. He's not even that close. After getting used to the in-your-face jump scares from the other two games, this one just seems incredibly tame by comparison. Nesquik makes fun milkshakes. But let's take it to the other extreme real quick. The animatronics from the previous games do make an appearance as hallucinations in Five Nights 3, and they're nothing short of heart attack material. From the haunting face of Balloon Boy plastered across your screen, to the ears bleeding wail of the mangle watching you from the outside window. If there's anything that's going to make you leap out of your seat in this one, it's these guys. Aside from that, the game is very quiet overall, which makes every sound effect that much more biting and unsettling. When any of your systems go offline, the sitting and the waiting and the reboot noise are just so aggravating. It feels like it's going on for days. Little quiet things too feel loud and make you panic because you're stuck, unable to do anything while these just tick away trying to reboot. It's a very well-crafted horror atmosphere. This, combined with the sickly green color that everything seems to be covered in makes the spookiness pretty real. Overall, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 brings the horror vibes with a vengeance. So let's get right into it. Like previous titles, this game has you checking cameras and making sure that your animatronic enemy doesn't reach the security room because that spells the end for you. The real difference here is that unlike Five Nights 1 and 2, the third game manages to make using the camera system absolutely necessary. Originally, the camera was useful on Nights 1 and 2, maybe 3, but became almost useless on the super hard nights later on. This time around, there's no magic set of motions that make everything go automatically well. You've got to find Springtrap on the cameras and use the Balloon Boy sound cues to lead him around to keep him from moving towards you. Hello? There are two layers of the map one of them being the hallways, and the other being the ventilation system. You can seal shut one vent at a time, which is helpful for keeping Springtrap from skipping the whole damn place and getting straight into the security room. I'm looking at you, Camera 10. You know what you did. 
or didn't do. Now, what keeps you in check from just spamming the audio is that your systems will go out after excessive use, or just over time. When your audio is off, you can't halt Springtrap or lead him away. When the video shuts down, you can't see where he is, and using audio will just leave you completely blind. And when the vents turn off, you'll start hallucinating and seeing the past game's animatronics haunting the building. Most of these are triggered in specific rooms on the video feed, and when you see them in the room, it's a standard reaction to take the camera down and see if something's wrong. Doing this, though, just means that they're getting a free, loud-as-all-get-out jump scare right at your face, and depending on which one it is, they're automatically gonna shut down some of your systems. The proper way of dealing with this is simply to change to another camera before putting the monitor away, but that's easier said than done when you're frantically looking for Springtrap and making sure he isn't already right on top of you. And really, that's all there is to it. Granted, most of the fun in this game is trial and error, and figuring out just how to do all this on your own, so an explanation like this doesn't really do a blind playthrough justice. A big change to the cameras that makes the game harder in general is how slowly they transition. They used to be really quick with little to no crossfade, but now you have to wait a second or two to make sure the static clears, and you've got to get a good look of the room before switching again. Coupled with Springtrap's tendency to stay very well hidden, and you've got a rough combination on your hands. You'll need to try your best to really look for Springtrap, and just when you think you found him... <laughs> Now, there's no challenge modes like in the second game, and there's actually not even a Night 7. Instead, Night 6 is referred to as Nightmare Mode, and is considerably harder than the previous nights. Your audio fails after two uses, and Springtrap moves pretty quickly. All in all, I'd say it's not as hard as the dreaded 2020-2020 modes, but it provides a good challenge. Like we said previously, this one is much less about getting a rhythm of certain actions going and more about quick thinking and prioritizing. Keeping your systems up can sometimes mean sacrificing one for a bit to ensure that you have a more important one staying up. Usually, video takes the bottom priority for two reasons. One, the ventilation can cause your vision to black out and Springtrap can attack you during those moments. And two, the audio is your only tool to move Springtrap from one room to another. This means you'll need to know the path that Springtrap takes through the building, as well as timing to make sure you don't lose track of him. It gets pretty rough, but it lends to a more skill-based and strategic gameplay than ever before. Also, it's stressful as balls. The main gameplay aspects are the secret mini-games that take place in between each night, and they require certain tasks for you to do. But since those are kind of a spoiler to the story, let's head right into the next- God! Oh, God! Really? Another jump scare? Ah! So you've passed through all of the nights leading up to this, and you've played every minigame so far. The minigames have you playing as what appears to be as Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie, Toy Chica, and regular Foxy in a location that doesn't quite line up with either layout of the restaurants from Five Nights 1 or 2. A Shadow Freddy figure floats away, telling you to follow him, and he leans you to the back corner of the building near some boarded up rooms. As soon as you reach the threshold to go into the next room up, you get an error message on your screen, and you can't access the room. As soon as you try and walk away, the infamous purple guy runs out of the room and dismantles you. The fifth night is pretty brutal. You only get two audio usages before it goes offline, and the jump scares seem to be everywhere. There's definitely skill involved in this, but you'll be overwhelmed quite a bit. In the fifth and final of these games, you instead play as what appears to be a dead child or ghost. No Shadow Freddy shows up this time, but you head on up to the same room either way. Once inside, you find Purple Man and four other dead children. He appears to be scared of you and tries to avoid you and run away when you get near. After a moment, the purple guy runs over to the spring bonnie suit on the floor and gets inside. He takes a moment and laughs before the spring locks inside of the suit, presumably covered in moisture from the rain leaking through the ceiling, break loose and kill him. With the purple guy now dead, the ghosts disappear, the screen fades to black, and... Wait, what? Bad ending? You see, there's actually two different endings in Five Nights at Freddy's 3. The bad ending is achieved for just playing through the game normally, but the good ending? Well, the good ending is gonna require quite a bit of explanation. Um, 
So on every single night, there's actually a secret Atari-style minigame that you can find by performing certain actions hinted at at the regular minigames. If you head left, then down, then down again in any of these games, you'll come to this room, which will have hints to the actions you need to take in order to enter the secret minigames. These hints can be pretty vague, so here's how to do each game in detail. Start out on night two, go to camera eight, and double click on this drawing right here, a balloon boy on the left wall. This will trigger Balloon Boy's air adventure. This minigame can be accessed on any night and needs to be played several times in order to unlock the good ending. Start by collecting all seven balloons in the starting area. Instead of heading to the exit, go to the platform above the exit and jump to the left out of the wall. Note that this only will open up after you have all seven balloons initially. Fall down and once you've landed, head to the right past the three crying balloon boys and jump into the last part of this room to collect the eighth and final balloon, ending the minigame. Now you want to head on over to camera seven. This one only works on night two. On the player one buttons for the arcade cabinet, click the top left, bottom left, top right, bottom right, and you'll start up Mangle's quest. Since you already did the eight balloon ending of the previous game, all you need to do is collect the pieces of Mangle while avoiding this kid. Once all the pieces are collected, head over above the exit and jump out of the wall, just like last time. Fall down and head left once you're near this giant puppet silhouette. Jump up onto the balloon platforms and those will take you to a big cake under a crescent moon. Grab the cake to end the game and then go back to Balloon Boy's Air Adventure. Now that you've gotten the cake, you can beat the Balloon Boy game for real. Clip out of the wall once again to the left and fall straight down to some new platform balloons. Simply jump over to the right, and you'll find a ghost child standing by himself on a platform. Walk up to him, give him cake, and the minigame ends. Next up is Chica's Party. On night three, you can find cupcakes with eyes on cameras two, three, four, and six. Click each of these to enter the Chica's Party minigame. Fall into the gap in the middle of the stage, then head left to find the ghost child. Simply jump up the balloons and give him cake. All right, now we apologize in advance for this one. This is the one that gets a little more than convoluted, to say the least. Your hint for this game is 395248. On night four, you need to click on the set of tiles on the wall in between the box of masks and the trash can in the room in front of you. It reads like a phone's dial pad, with the number one being the tile slightly covered up by the guitar. Punch in 395248 to start up the Stage 01 minigame. Let's be real for a second, I will explain this as best I can, and I am so sorry that this is confusing. First, you play as Golden Freddy. Start by walking off the stage towards the children and then turning around in the air to bump into the stage. If you do this correctly, you'll glitch out and slide through the stage until you're out of bounds. Step one, completed. You'll fall down past two other stages and land on the floor. Head right one screen and use the right side of this room to boost up on top of it. Once on top, get positioned above Golden Bonnie and jump around until you clip upwards into the room above you. Walk over to the right wall and use it to boost up again and clip back out of the room on top. You still with me? Great. Get into the room above you the same way you did last time, right above Golden Bonnie. In this one, though, use the left wall to shoot up on top of the room. You're now on the very top of the map, so simply walk over to the right and jump off the edge to end up in the Ghost Child secret room and end the minigame. Woo! Wow. <laughs> what? That's it? Just... Wow. Come on, Beardy, we're not even done yet. All right, okay, so the next one isn't quite as complicated. On night five, click on the Shadow Bonnie figure on the right side of the desk to begin the glitch mini game. By holding W, you can fly, and by bashing S, you can change which room you're in. The rooms will be different rooms from the previous games you've already played. One of the rooms will be mostly purple with a ghost child outside on the left. You can exit the same way you exited the Balloon Boy's room. Once outside of the stage, change over to the ghost child room and walk over to him to give him cake and end this minigame. And lastly, once you've completed the Shadow Bonnie game, click over to camera three and double click the picture of the puppet on the right side wall. Walk to the right until you reach a table with four masked children standing in front of it and one crying. Put the cake on the table and the final minigame is complete. 
play your way through Night 5 successfully to achieve the good ending, signifying the dead children's souls are finally at peace. The check mark of stars on the main menu returns as our symbol for completion in this game. Beating the game with the bad ending gets you one star, unlocks nightmare mode, and a mini option menu labeled extras. Nightmare mode acts as the sixth night mode of this game, with the AI being that much more aggressive and scary. Beating this night, which is no easy feat, will get you another star and more extras. And finally, after doing all the mini games I just told you about and beating the game, the combination of achieving the good ending, the bad ending, and nightmare mode puts three gold stars on the main menu, meaning you've completed it. The extra menu will be fully accessible when you have all three stars. You get to view still images of Springtrap and all the Phantomatronics, and even see their jump scares in action. Hooray! More jump scares! <laughs> You also get a cheat menu with four options. Fast Nights is pretty self-explanatory, making the time move faster for the main game. Radar will show where Springtrap is on the map at all times, so you never have to go around and look for him. Aggressive will make Springtrap more difficult to deal with, allowing you to in essence create a makeshift Night 7 by turning on Aggressive and then playing Night 6. And finally, No Errors keeps all of your systems online at all times. Even though these bonuses aren't super great incentives to go all out, the game is so short that you don't really feel ripped off for putting in the effort to unlock everything, especially if you've already completed the other two Five Nights at Freddy's games. Five Nights 3 really changed the direction from what we got in Five Nights 2. In the second game, there were tons of challenges for somebody interested in more than just the main story. They were difficult, they were very frustrating, and for the thrill seekers out there, they were a lot of fun. Five Nights 3 tones it back and goes for more of a horror experience than a horror game. Completing Nightmare Mode pales in comparison to 420 Mode or the upsetting 1020 challenge from previous games. Not to say that this one isn't rewarding, as the fleshed out story based minigames and strategy centric gameplay makes completing it all the more fun. Now usually, we end our Five Nights reviews with me overcoming the difficultness of these games with something as hard as 1020 or 420 modes. But there isn't one in this game, and this makes the end game much more easy and way more manageable considering the circumstances. The fandom of Five Nights 3, however, did come up with their own version of a completionist end. Completing Nightmare Mode with the aggressive code on is kind of the challenge, but doing so does nothing if you beat it. All in all, I think I only put about a total of three hours into Five Nights at Freddy's 3 once I realized how it all worked. That's not a bad thing, it's just kind of a different thing. And that's a good way to end the series in my opinion. It may not necessarily be completely different or edgy or weird, but it's a nice ending to this trilogy. If there is going to be a fourth, who knows what to expect. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is a great conclusion to a trilogy of awesome indie horror games that answers enough questions in the story to be satisfying, yet at the same time raises enough questions to continue the series' mysteriously filled legacy. With a slightly less aggravating difficulty than its predecessors, and a more focused set of game mechanics, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 may be the easiest of the trilogy, but don't knock it out as that's not necessarily a bad thing. Everything just balances itself out. So, with that in mind, guys, this game gets our completionist rating of... FINISH IT! FINISH IT! Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss out on any future completionist goodness. And if you want some more Five Nights at Freddy's stuff, check out our playlist right here on the left. If you want some more game theories involving Five Nights at Freddy's, give this playlist a click on the right right here. That's all the time we've got for today, guys. So please, as always, leave your thoughts somewhere in the internet. Be sure to check out our awesome brand new t-shirts over at theyeti.com slash thatonevideogamer. And of course, a big thank you to Matt Pat for coming back on the show. It's always a pleasure having you here. And a big thank you to Gerard and his beard, which is just, you can't experience this <laughs> on the other side of the camera, but it is magnificent to behold in person. I try, I try. Magnificent. Now, now you're braiding it, or what? Like, now, if you excuse me, I'm going to braid my beard on camera. Ooh.
And by braid, I mean I'm just doing twisting this over and over again and not really. Here, I, I, I can French braid in here. Oh, this is where this is where it starts. This is where. Oh, let the shipping the begin. Sh the shipping starts now. Let the shipping now. begin. You're actually doing a pretty solid job. Thank I need you. Like, feel. Right, right, right. Is hurt at all? No, no, no. You're good. Crusty. Mm, <laughs> <laughs> there you go, internet. Start writing your fanfics. <laughs>